NFTs and tokenized property are there to invoke a sense of ownership. Personal property is an intuition. This is mine. I can make use of it. I can enjoy it. I can display it without having to ask anyone else, without being beholden to others. The reasons for our demands on property go very, very deep. We use property, of course, to build wealth. And that's a big part of what's going on in the cryptocurrency and NFT space. Of course, that's what's going on. But also, we use it to associate things with us that are part of our identities, right? So for example, this is my property. This is my wedding ring, right? Um, this is my property. I hold it off of the market under Peggy Radin's theories. I hold it off of the market precisely because it means something to me. I've chosen not to sell my home precisely because it means more to me than it does to anyone else. And so we use property to associate, to surround ourselves and give our identities meaning. Having that stripped away from us in the online context because of the claim that intellectual property was threatened by the, by the copy-based nature of computing environments, um, therefore is a major threat to the rise of NFTs. When I've talked to people about interests in NFTs, what they, as I've said earlier, what routinely comes across the board is you don't own the NFT, you just license it. It's the same story that we heard from your Kindle eBooks um, and that we heard from your movies, books, and music. And if that's true, the NFT space is going nowhere fast. And I think that it's really indicative. So, so then what I do in the paper is I, I basically lay that out. I say, look, that's the problem. The problem is we've forgotten history. And history says there's this tension between personal property interests in I own the object and intellectual property interests, which is I own the ability to make infinite copies. We have a technology now that through blockchain permits us to create true digital uniqueness, true digital scarcity. And it does, it solves the copying problem. Blockchain was intended to solve the double spending problem, to say, no, I can't make infinite duplicates of tokens. The distributed ledger framework inhibits me effectively from doing that. And so now we've got both a crying need for personal property interests. People want to collect, they want to invest, they want to associate, they want to build their identity based on personal property, just like, just like anyone who's listening to this might look around the room they're in and think, what, what objects in this room are important to you and why, right? Why does it matter to you that somebody just can't come in and take them away from you? But then, and so we have this crying market need for it. We have a technology that'll do it. And yet, as you, as, you, as you can see, if you read through the paper, that's not at all the law if where the rubber hits the road. So where the rubber hits the road, um, you look at these licenses and these licenses say a bunch of quite surprising things. They more or less say, you own something, but we don't really ever wanna tell you what that is. And what you don't own is what you think you own. You don't, if you buy an NFT, if you buy a picture, in most cases, you don't own even much of a license to that picture. The, the copyright generator still retains the right to make copies. Fair enough, they should. But they shouldn't have any rights anymore over this copy, especially over the marked copy, over the copy, the first copy, the copy that has historical importance. That's one reason why people buy NFTs, for example, is because of the historical importance of the document or the moment or whatever in the history of the internet or in the history of the development of property. Um, and we, we have solved that problem by associating intellectual property with a unique and non-falsifiable, non-duplicatable token um, and that is on a distributed network. We have solved the problem of you can't make infinite copies of that copy. Sure, it's like the Mona Lisa, right? You can, anybody can go into the Louvre and you know, if you avoid the guard, you, you can take a snapshot of the Mona Lisa, but it's not the Mona Lisa. It's not that one thing. We've solved that and humans wanna create enormous value by investing in that, by attaching to it. But they can't as long as these intellectual property licenses continue to act, they're drafted by lawyers. And in a sense, this is, you know, this is my profession's fault that look like the Apple iTunes agreement. That, that can't be how this goes anymore. And so what I then do is point out that there are robust ways of pushing back against this conception that people who buy NFTs really don't really don't own anything at all, um, that, that there are ways of pushing back and saying, no, when you sell to someone, when you, when you characterize the transaction as a sale, 
then there are real reasons to treat it as a sale of personal property. Just like anything else you buy in a store, there's reasons to treat it as a sale of personal property. That the object now, digital object, but fine, who cares? It's, it's just like a physical object. We coded it to be, so of course it is. That it has the main characteristics. Now, what are those characteristics? Well, well one characteristic is simply ownership. Ownership means that you can use, you can display, you can modify, you can change, you can destroy if you want. You can exclude others from using your property in any way that you wish, right? The, the old school definition, which has since been changed substantially, but it still has some, some emotional resonances. Property is that soul and despotic dominion over something, right? The real ability to control it. And and what you see in these licenses and these contracts that are attached to NFTs is that's not the case. NFTs come with contractual sneaky license strings attached. Strange things like if your NFT blows up and becomes really valuable, you can only profit up to $10,000 worth of that. Or you have to come and get a separate license from us to, uh, to monetize it. Or every time if your NFT rises in value, every time you and anyone else sells it forward, a little bit of money has to be kicked back to the originator. Now, these terms are hidden in the smart contracts themselves. They're not even hidden the usual way where terms are hidden. Now, look, let me be clear. Nobody reads contracts to start with, right? Terms are hidden in paragraph 19b, subparagraph 43 um, of the regular contracts that we all click on online to, to even turn on a computer. You have, to, you have to sign a stack of contracts this high even to turn it on. But beyond that, Beyond, beyond that, these terms are hidden in the code, in sort of nested legal language that is nested inside code that is nested inside legal language. And that's my alarm telling me to wrap it up and I'll bring this brief presentation to a close and we can then talk about whatever you want. But, but having these trailing hidden strings in NFTs, what it means is you never quite know what you're buying when you buy an NFT. Right, because it comes with layered legal language that nobody knows what it means yet. It comes layered with legal language that nobody reads. It comes layered with smart contract trailing provisions that may be quite surprising to someone who has embraced the legal metaphor of property. And that's the thing, if we're gonna embrace the legal metaphor of personal property ownership by telling people, this is what you're buying, you're buying it. You're not renting it. You're not paying for reputational rights. This isn't a sort of a shout out that you get. This is, we're selling these things to people. And if we're gonna tap into that intuition of property, it needs to have the legal characteristics of actual property. So that's the paper in a nutshell saying, look, there's this, this history of saying law can't keep up with technology. It's not true. The problems of law have been here. The problems that NFTs face right now, the big, the big complaint, oh, you can just right click on an NFT and make a copy of it, right? That's just straight back to Napster. That, that, that is the same problem we've always had. The technology has changed in ways that have enabled this, this groundswell of demand that people have to own things to really blow out into the open. But people are still fundamentally being defrauded by these transactions because they're being sold things, or they're being told that they're buying things, but they're not buying them. They're being told that they are the owners and investors in things that they don't really own or invest. And instead they have these, these hidden license terms and these hidden code terms that do not create good standardized models where people can with confidence buy and know what legal rights they're getting when they do. And that's where I'll turn it over to you. Thank you.